The years 1895 to 1904 in college football history was a period marked by chaos and fight for control as college football continued to evolve into the game we love today. The big four in the East, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, and Penn, controlled the rules and how the game was played. Teams in the West, like the University of Chicago and Michigan, because that was how the West was referred to in those days, began to resent that control and fought for more representation. College football popularity grew, but so did the spotlight and that spotlight was cast upon its brutal nature. The powers that be did their best to control the narrative, but they were only successful in covering up the game's problems. Everyone failed to see the crisis that would occur in 1905 when the public erupted in disgust at the number of deaths and serious injuries caused by football. So how did it happen? How did the crisis come about, and why were so many people being killed and injured? Those are among the questions I will ask and answer in this college football history episode. I am John Johnston, and this is 1895 to 1904, Prelude to Disaster. We're going to start by talking about the brutality and violence that was college football in that era. Why was the game so violent? Well, it's pretty clear that playing football in that era itself required Herculean effort. David Nelson, in his book Anatomy of a Game, tells us that the 1902 Chicago-Wisconsin game had 112 plays in the first half. The Michigan-Chicago game had 100 plays in each of the 45-minute halves. Now keep in mind that there's no substitutions, unless you're seriously injured. But guys played both ways. They played offense and defense. The clock didn't stop on first downs to give them a rest. Uh, there were no incomplete passes to pause the game because there is no forward pass. It's not legalized yet. There's basically 200 plays a game of mass plays repeated over and over and over over the course of a game. Note this game footage from 1903 from Yale and Princeton is shot by Thomas Edison. It's from the Library of Congress. Note how the players line up in a mass, fall in a mass, and then get up and do roughly the same thing over again. Now imagine doing that 200 times. But it wasn't just the style of play that was causing injuries and death. There were other contributing factors. And we'll get into these in the next segments. One of the biggest problems is that there's no firm rule that declares when the ball is dead. Players are supposed to cry down when they believe the play has stopped. And the problem isn't obvious to us as modern day football watchers. These days there are clear rules stating when a ball carrier is down and the play is dead. Not so much for the early days of football. The rule from 1896 reads as, if the forward movement of the ball is stopped, or if the runner shall cry down, the ball shall be deemed to be down. Piling up thereafter shall be penalized by a distance of 15 yards. Historian John Watterson says of this problem, the absence of a clear definition of when the ball was actually dead led to down ball carriers trying to crawl to eke out a final yards and opponents jumping on them to prevent their progress. Newspaper accounts talk of players who gained yardage by crawling after they were tackled. As long as they didn't call themselves down, typically they were free to go until the defense forced them to call themselves down. Now, during an open play, it wasn't difficult to see that the player was down. In other words, that they were running in the open field. Maybe the referee or the official would see the player down and blow their whistle to call the play dead. But most of the time, the scrimmage was a mass play, and it was difficult to see if the runner was down or the ball was down. 
And then everybody ended up in a mass pile, and then they ended up fighting over the ball in those mass piles. And because of the mass plays, the official wouldn't blow his whistle because he couldn't see the player and he couldn't see the ball. And if the player with the ball called himself down while he was in one of those piles, he might be difficult to hear. Because keep in mind, there's thousands of people at some of these games. So there's a lot of fighting over the ball in a pile. Regarding players crawling, historian Park Davis relates a play from a game between Amherst and Harvard in 1903. And he says, Coggeshall, who is a player, dives for the ball and then with a mountain of crimson jerseys upon him, crawls seven yards and makes a touchdown. So he's, he crawls seven yards with guys on him to make a touchdown. Interesting to watch, I guess. From the Boston Globe, from November 8th, 1903, is this passage. There were times today when three or four of Captain Marshall's players would get to the man with the ball and literally drag him out of the arms of tackling Quakers and carry him along for good gains. This was done many times when Nichols, the ball carrier, was sent in between the guards and tackles. And once he was pushed and pulled along for 20 yards, although he seemed to be stopped before he had made any gain. Now, the piling up penalty, which we call piling on now, was supposed to account for players jumping on another player when they were down, but as I said, the mass plays made it difficult to see, and the officials were reluctant to call penalties. If they called penalties against the home team, they might be barred from being an official again, so it was easier for them to just look the other way or claim that they didn't see a foul. There's also no neutral zone. There's a line of scrimmage, per se, but there's no rule that requires be separated from each other on the line. Therefore, they line up right next to each other, and as one account stated, brow to brow. And as the play started, they typically started by slugging each other. One newspaper account I read talked about how 20 minutes of the 60-minute game he watched was nothing but fighting between two of the opposing linemen. Still another problem, little protective equipment. There was precious little protective equipment as we are familiar with today. Uniforms started out in 1895 or earlier as canvas, and then they progressed to players wearing shin guards, uh, nose guards, which were rather bizarre in their appearance. And the nose guards are made out of rubber, but they protected players from broken noses and broken teeth. Helmets weren't used until the early 1900s, being referred to as head harnesses, but even then players refused to wear them, complaining of added weight and that it interfered with their hearing. It will take several years before helmets become mandatory because of these complaints. Another problem, there is no incentive to run outside the tackles. You only needed five yards to make a first down in three tries and keep the ball, so why not hammer away at the inside? There was little to no benefit or incentive to run outside the tackles. So Walter Camp in 1902 proposed that they change the rules so the teams had to get 10 yards to get a first down in three downs to keep possession, but everyone is opposed because they think the game will devolve into nothing but kicking. So as the spotlight grows on college football, so does the criticism. Charles Eliot, the president of Harvard, was a very vocal critic. He had released a scathing report about football in 1895. He railed against the big game environment of football. Sports distracted students from intellectual interests, he said. Big games generated substantial gate receipts, making money rather than education the driving force behind the games. They also produced an unwholesome desire for victory, which Eliot likened to the supreme savagery of war. Eliot hated the fact that the game was dangerous, complaining about sprains, wrenches, congestion of the brain, the breaking of bones, the loss of teeth, and the stiffening of the joints. He hated that it encouraged players to hurt each other, which it did. 
There are several accounts in which players are clearly coached to take out the best player on the other team. In one case, a Nebraska representative tries to get football abolished because his son boasted about disabling the best player on the other team. So Elliot, he didn't just go away over the years, and his complaints are joined by many others. In March 1903, the Harvard faculty try to get football abolished. It's a sign that even the, one of the biggest players in the college football hemisphere has problems with its own faculty because of the criticism. So Professor Ira Hollis, chairman of the Harvard Athletic Committee, says it would be very easy for him to abolish the sport, stating, I am not opposed to the right kind of football. I only object to the brutal gladiatorial contests into which, under the present rules, it has degenerated. I am not in favor of giving up the annual game with Yale. In fact, I shall do all in my power to promote the game. But I hold that Harvard and Yale should not play under the present rules. And it's implied that Hollis is the one that stops football from being abolished at Harvard in the hopes that the rules change. And if it would have been abolished at Harvard, that would have been a really big feather in the bonnet of the hat of the critics and probably spread like wildfire. A favorite media take of the time was comparing boxing to football. And you see these articles in the papers from between the years, much like you see articles about sports that are standard fare now. For example, every spring or every fall, somebody does an article about the five best players you need to watch or the five most underrated coaches. You know, those are kind of standard articles you see all the time. In one such article comparing boxing to football from the Honolulu Advertiser on December 15th, 1904, the writer states, if square decent sport could be looked for anywhere, it would be supposed to go in a game where two teams of young men represent Christian associations. In this game that he watched, a young man named Weaver was working hard for the Steelton team, and it appeared to the young fellows on the other team that, in order to win, it was necessary to cripple or maim this enterprising member of the rival team, and they proceeded to do so forthwith. In one of the rallies of the second half, Three or four of the young men on the railroad team tackled Weaver and threw him to the ground. He fell so hard that he was rendered unconscious and lay stunned for several minutes. He was picked up and carried the sidelines and laid on a board. Nobody paid any attention to him for a while when a doctor was hunted up and he pronounced the young fellow from suffering from a concussion to the brain. Then the board, with the unconscious man lying on it, was carried out of sight and a patrol wagon sent for, which in due course of time hauled him to the nearest hospital. No effort was made to find out who injured this young fellow. No arrests were made, and though a large force of policemen was on hand, the incident passed by and the guardians of the peace never took the slightest notice of it. There were thousands of people present, including several hundred women, and yet the occurrence was passed without notice. Had this occurred at a boxing match, all hands connected with the affair would have been placed under arrest and held to await the results of the man's injuries. And once more, a hue and cry had been raised about the brutality of boxing. So media back then can be just as sarcastic as they can be today. Note this illustration from Puck Magazine in 1899. The caption reads, Mrs. Newcomb, her first game, Oh, isn't it awful? Horrible. Why? They will kill that man underneath. Her daughter, an enthusiast. Oh, he doesn't mind it, mother. He's unconscious by this time. Football had its defenders. Walter Camp, the father of American football, had written the book Football Facts and Figures, which included a survey with former players and letters from them espousing the virtues of football and it's largely a propaganda book and it's successful in doing what it needs to do with regards to football propaganda. But one such letter in the book came from Frederick Remington who gained fame from his depictions of Western America and Remington says, I do not believe in all this namby-pamby talk and hope the game will not be emasculated and robbed of its heroic qualities. 
which is its charm and its distinctive quality. People who don't like football as now played might like whist. Advise them to try that. And I had to look it up, but whist is a card game. A University of Illinois professor named Edwin Dexter carried out the first survey of football players regarding injuries and concluded that football was actually pretty safe. So Dexter sent questionnaires to 58 colleges. Out of the 210,000 students over the 10 years of 1893 to 1902, only about 23,000 played football, so roughly about 10%. And that, that stood against the argument that it was detracting from intellectual pursuits or studies. And of those 23,000 players, only 654 were injured enough to miss classes, which is about 2%. He also finds only three deaths directly related to football. The study is published in newspapers across the nation, and it helps quell the anger about how violent the game is, at least for a little bit. The thing is, later on, the viability of his study is questioned, and as the 1905 crisis explodes, it's never used in the defense of football, so it really wasn't that worth that much, but it did, like I said, quell the anger at the time, so it accomplished its purpose. Let's go back to the 1895 season for a moment. With regards to rules making, the 1895 season is played in utter chaos. The rules committee from the previous season split in two and couldn't stick together and they couldn't agree on a uniform set of rules. The problem is that Princeton and Yale want to completely abolish the momentum plays, like the flying wedge, but Harvard and Penn are opposed. Cornell joins with Harvard and Penn. And this is results. The result of this is that teams end up with multiple sets of rules, and it's possible for them to play up to under three different sets of rules throughout during the 1895 season. And it also results in everybody being angry at the Big Four, like I mentioned, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, and Penn, and demanding that they figure everything out. And the outcry is so great that the schools, the big four, are forced to get back together, and they eliminate the momentum plays, like the flying wedge, where players are moving before the ball is put in play and running at the line in a mass. And they, they don't outlaw the mass plays, but they outlaw the momentum plays. And over the next few years, they make rule changes, some of which affect the game to make it more modern, but they can't let go of the past. And the mass plays stay in place because... No one wants to change. In 1903, for example, they changed the rules so that seven players have to be on the line of scrimmage, but only in the middle of the field. And it's supposed to cut down on the number of mass plays, but when the teams reach the 25-yard line, only five players are required to be on the line of scrimmage. So they go back to the mass plays. The reason for that is because the powers that be don't want any scores happening under the new rules. From 1895 to 1904, the college football powers failed to recognize the game was in trouble. They thought they were in control, and they would be wrong. Nobody saw a crisis coming, but it comes about at the end of 1905 as the Chicago Tribune publishes an article entitled Death Harvest, stating that 18 players have died playing football while 137 were seriously injured. 1905 will be the subject of my next video on college football history. I'm John Johnston, the founder of Corn Nation. I hope you enjoy these videos. Please give me some feedback and what you'd like to see or if anything I could be doing that better or different. Please subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you for watching and thank you for the support.